have your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21 on this Palm Sunday. And I want to give you some pictures out of this passage that I think it's really going to speak to us. And not only as we look back 2,000 years ago to this significant day in biblical history, but I think it's going to speak so much to the season that we're living in today. Don't you love that about God's Word? You know, regardless of where you find yourself or what you're experiencing or going through, the Word of God just speaks directly to where you are. And I I thank you for the, the heart that you have to receive God's Word. Read with me in Matthew chapter 21, starting with verse 1. The Bible says this, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, and they came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them. Come on, somebody say, the Lord needs them. Say, the Lord needs them, and then he will send them at once. Verse 4, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Actually, the prophet was Zechariah saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Can I have an amen for the reading of the word? You know, right here in this first portion of Matthew chapter 21, we see a picture of Jesus that I think is very unique. And, and if you're taking notes, I want you to write down three things specifically. And the first picture is we see Jesus on this cult, the cult. And I want you to know what the cult represents. The cult represents the humility of Jesus. This is a very unique, very interesting picture. How many of you know that what you drive and how you arrive says a lot? Can I have a good amen? Okay, what you drive and how you arrive, how you make an entrance, and and the mode of transportation in which you get there. I think your vehicle says something about you, or at least other people are are saying something about you based on the vehicle that you drive. I want to do a little word association with those here in the studio, and I want you to play along with us, too, at home. I want you to tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. If I say, okay, I see somebody driving a truck, what does a truck say about an individual? A man's man is driving a truck. Come on. A truck says what? We got to work. We're going to get some stuff done. Come on, all you truck drivers. We appreciate you. We thank God for you. When you're driving a pickup truck, you got it going on. Get stuff done, okay? What if somebody's driving a convertible? What does a convertible say? Yeah, spoiled. <laughs> Speed. Cool. Yeah, just chill. Man, hey, in weather like this, man, oh, man, it's nice to have a convertible. If you own a convertible, I, man, I'll take a ride with you. I, of course, I stay in the back seat, social distancing. Okay, uh, what about a Prius? If you're going to drive a Prius, what does a Prius say? <laughs> a Prius says you care about the environment. Come on, somebody. I guess nobody in here is eco-friendly. What? <laughs> Y'all driving them dually diesels, man, polluting the air. Okay, what about a motorcycle? What does a motorcycle say? (laughs) Trouble. (laughs) You're driving dangerously. Maybe you love nature. You just love to be out in the open air. Um, What about a minivan? What does a minivan say? Oh, yeah. A minivan says, I got kids. All right. A 12-passenger van says, I got a lot of kids. Okay, Um, an SUV says, I got kids, but I still want to drive in style. Come on. Uh, What about a Honda Accord? What does a Honda Accord say? A Honda says, bless God, it's paid for. Come on, somebody. 2008, 170,000 miles. Come on, me and Jesus all in one accord. Can I have a good amen? How many of you know that it, you're probably not going to see the president or some dignitary, you're not going to see the president get off of Air Force One and get ushered into a Honda, right? You're probably not going to see that. You know, I think it's, it's interesting here that this is one of the biggest, most important days in Jesus' ministry. And look at his mode of transportation. Look at how he enters into this thing. I'm like, for real, Jesus? I mean, man, this is your big 
uh, unveiling. Okay, this is your big opportunity. And Jesus comes rolling in on a colt. A colt is a young donkey. All right, talk about making an entrance. I mean, I'm just wondering, what, is this, what does this mode of transportation say? I mean, nobody rides a donkey on a day like this. Surely Jesus could have rented something a little bit better. You know what I'm saying? But he did this on purpose. This cult speaks of humility. I, I, I love this about Jesus. I know, you know, Revelation says this scripture about the Lord. Now, this is at the end of days, Revelation 19, 11. Now, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. Somebody say a white horse. I saw a white horse, and he who sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his, on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. Now, see, this is the end of days when Jesus returns. He's not coming in on a donkey, on a colt, but he's riding a white horse. The Bible says that he's making war and he will judge. Yet here on Palm Sunday, Jesus comes in on a colt, the humility of a donkey. And it's not to declare war on Rome, but it's to declare war on sin and death. It's not to cast judgment, but it's to come under judgment. Come on, are you with me? The, the cult says something about humility. This is a beautiful and a powerful picture that the, the gospel writer Matthew intentionally paints for us. All of the power and authority of heaven, and he comes riding in on a cult. One of the things I love most about Jesus is his humility. You know, there's just something irresistible about humility. There, there's something that's so refreshing. You know why? Because it's opposite of the world that we live in. You know, we live in a world that is very self-promoting, a world that's all about becoming famous. It's very narcissistic. I mean, everything is a step and an opportunity to promote yourself, but yet Jesus comes in on his big day. He comes in in such humility, so opposite of the expectations of people. You know, one of the things I love about our church, one of the things I love about our staff, and especially I, I, I love our, our worship team. Haven't we been blessed over the last four weeks with some amazing praise and worship? We have some of the most gifted, talented, and anointed people to create environments of worship that I have ever been a part of. Yet they're not about themselves. I think it's rare when you have a, a highly gifted individual who's also humble about their gifts. They don't make it about them. They're not up here saying, look at me, but they're trying to say to all of us, look at him. Look at Jesus. That's one of the things I love about Rachel. I love that about my wife. This girl is drop-dead gorgeous. Oh, man, she's the prettiest thing I've ever laid eyes on, yet she's just so non-assuming. You know, she, she, when I first met her in high school, I mean, she wasn't about herself, you know. And from day one until now, I mean, I've just seen this beautiful spirit inside of her. She's gorgeous inside and out. You know, I, I love that about people. I love that about, I was thinking about some of my close friends, Baby Blue Eyes, Pastor Johnny Green. You know, he's one of the smartest guys I know, for real. I mean, he, he actually went to, like, Bible college. Man, man he, he went to, like, seminary. This guy knows the word. But, you know, he never talks about himself. And, and, and I love that. I think there's something about humility that's so endearing. And here Jesus comes riding in on this cult. And there's something about a spirit of humility that's so attractive. You know, I guess my question is, you know, are we, are we, are we building our own brand are we building the kingdom of God? You know, I remember I, years ago, I went to, to lunch with a group of pastors. And, uh, man, you know, when you get a, a group of pastors together, it's just like talk, 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 talk. And it's all about show and tell. And, man, we want to show and tell. We want, hey, here's what God's doing at my church, and here's what we're doing. Man, check this out, and it's show and tell. And, well, my show and tell is bigger than your show and tell. And, and you know, so you got them all around the table. And I felt the Lord just kind of whisper in my spirit. He says, Mike, don't say a word about you or the church unless somebody asks. Do you know, it was a quiet lunch because nobody asked anything about me. And then the Lord hit me and said, Mike, you see, even in ministry, there's a tendency to make it about yourself. And I think we got to be careful. Listen, we said yes to Jesus, not to be famous, 
but to make him famous. And if we're going to make him famous, we're okay with being anonymous. Can I have a good amen? You see, this cult signifies humility. And I want you to know something about humility. And I think this is so important, especially in the season that we're living in now, because we're in a place where we are desperate for healing. Can I tell you, healing comes through humility. Think about 2 Chronicles 7, 14. The Bible says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land Oh, hear me. We need healing in this nation. We are desperate not just for physical healing in our bodies, but we need healing within the soul of this nation. Can I have a good amen? And healing only comes through humility. You see, there's something irresistible. There's something so attractive about humility. And when we humble ourselves before God, I think heaven is so very near. Heaven is present. Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem on this donkey, and it's a picture of humility. Look at what it says in verse 8. The Bible says in verse 8, most of the crowds spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. First, we see the colt represents the humility of Jesus, but here I want you to see the crowd. Number two, the crowd represents the joy of Jesus. Now, check this out. Jesus is riding into Jerusalem, and when I read this passage, I I rewind the clock. Several years ago, I had a chance to make a trip to the Holy Land and walked into the city of Jerusalem down this path that many scholars believe Jesus actually took in this triumphal entry. And I can see the road as it twists, and it it, kind of winds and turns, and then it comes up into this beautiful city. And in my mind, I'm seeing thousands upon thousands of people. In fact, history tells us that the city of Jerusalem probably was two to 300,000 people. That was its population. But during the time of Passover, it swelled to nearly 3 million people, 10 times its population during these holy festivals. And here Jesus is coming in, riding on the donkey, and, and there's this great parade. I'm telling you, this was a celebration. People were excited. This was a party. I'm sure there were Roman guards trying to control the crowd. But, man, there was something big. This was an epic moment, not just for the city of Jerusalem, but for everyone who had any kind of spiritual compass because here comes the Messiah. The streets were lined with people and filled with joy. And let me stop right here and say this because I rode, I had to run an errand the other day, and, and many of you have to get out sometimes to go to grocery store or, or you know, get, uh, you know, a prescription filled. Man, our streets currently, they just feel so empty. You know, it, it feels desolate and barren. And there's almost like a, a heaviness that's hovering over our communities. When I read this passage again this week, I begin to see prophetically that there's a spirit of joy that's coming back to Baton Rouge. And it will return based on the presence of Jesus. When Jesus comes in, this spirit of freedom and liberty comes back to our community. Man, things will come alive. And I'm praying that. I'm I'm prophesying that. I'm believing that for you and for your family and for our community. And here we see this, this celebration happening. And the Bible says something interesting. The scripture says that they took their garments, they took their coats, and they laid them down on the streets. Okay. Now, history tells us that in the ancient world, it wasn't like they had a closet full of clothes. I know some of you, (laughs) some of you walk into your closet, and then you're looking at three walls of clothes, and you're saying, man, I just got nothing to wear. (laughs) Man, they literally, 2,000 years ago, only had one prized garment. I want you to see, they took those garments off, and they laid them on the streets. Now, this was Jesus' big reveal moment. Okay, it's kind of like a gender reveal. You know how they have those gender reveal parties now? And, man, they're either popping balloons or, you know, they're hitting baseballs and exploding, you know, this pink powder or, you know. I mean, I've seen it all, you know. Or this is kind of like, remember the show um, um, Home Improvement? Um, uh, what is it? Uh, makeover, Extreme Makeover Home home Edition where they would rebuild, remodel the houses. And, you know, they, they'd say, move that bus. It's like, ah! <laughs> 
years. This is kind of the, the, the move that bus moment. For Je- There's this revelation. I want you to consider Jesus never acknowledged that he was the Messiah until this moment. Think about it. He wasn't self-promoting. In fact, you read throughout the Gospels, he referred to himself as the Son of Man. That's how he identified himself. Even when he would cast devils out of people, demons would recognize that he was the Son of, son of God. Why are you troubling us? And Jesus would forbid them to speak. But now this is this, this big revelation moment. The Messiah, the one that had been prophesied hundreds of years prior, he's coming into the community and they're taking off their garments and they're laying them on the road and they're singing and they're shouting. The Bible says not only did they take off their garments and stretch them across the street, but they took these palm branches. You know what the palm branch represents? Victory. The palm branch is kind of like, I guess today, if you were to have like this big purple and yellow flag, that says national champions, 15 and 0, your mama. Um, and we're waving the flag saying, we're number one. Because last I checked, we're still number one. It, this is what they were doing with the palm branches saying, victory, our Messiah has come. This was a party. This was a celebration, and Jesus was filled with joy. Now, notice this. His joy would eventually turn to sorrow. I mean, you know what's happening in just a week. Palm Sunday, he's being celebrated, but on Good Friday, he's being crucified. Sorrow turns, or joy turns to sorrow, but then sorrow turns back to joy on Resurrection Sunday. And I I thought about, okay, Jesus knew what was in front of him. How did Jesus endure the pain that was about to take place? The scripture tells us in Hebrews 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. How how did Jesus endure the cross? Well, he set joy in front of him. Let me ask you this. How do we endure this pandemic, this crisis? We're going to have to set joy in front of us. Jesus knew that sorrow was coming, but he enjoyed the moment. He didn't allow the dread of what's ahead. Come on now, think about that. Don't allow the dread of what's ahead to steal the joy that's right here in front of you. I think this is a word for somebody because sometimes we'll walk around with a spirit of gloom and doom and there's this dread because we're thinking, how long is this going to last? Where's the finish line? How will I ever get through? And and listen, I get it, church. I, I understand. I'm not trying to minimize the pain that people are walking in. Some of you have suffered sickness in your own body. Some of you have lost family members and friends because of this pandemic. A lot of you have lost your jobs. I know that over the last week and a half, two weeks, over 10 million people have filed for unemployment. Uh, Some of you small business owners are, are, are wondering, will we ever open our doors again? I'm not trying to minimize the difficulty of today. But I want to encourage you, how do you make it through the difficulty of today? You've got to set joy in front of you. It's going to allow you to make it through the darkness and the difficulty because on the other side of this, there's joy. Uh, we, We got to stay positive in the pandemic. Okay, and there's some practical things that we can do. You know, it's really interesting. I, and I, I, I follow social media m- like many of you. And, you know, it's, it's filled with mixed messages. But I find myself gravitating toward the good things that are happening in spite of the craziness. You know, and that's one way of setting joy in front of you. You know, uh, it, it's, it's been so amazing to see through your generosity and through the active serving of a handful of people here. We've been able to go into hospitals and give gift baskets. In fact, I think we've got some pictures. I want you to see there's some snack baskets that we've been able to bring into Lady of the Lake and Oshner Hospital. And and so these nurses, how many of you are thankful for the healthcare professionals? Oh my goodness. Listen, we're just so grateful for you. You men and women who 
put yourselves out there. You're working 12, 14, 16-hour days. You're putting it on the line. I mean, uh, putting yourself in harm's way, the risk that you're taking. I know there's concern about bringing sickness back into your home and your family. Uh, I just want to say thank you for your courage and how you serve. These little gift baskets are just a, a small token of great appreciation. And, and the, some of the ladies over at Oshner, they'd receive our gift basket, and so they had an idea. Well, why don't we just kind of pay it forward? Why don't we, after we've enjoyed the little goodies, let's replenish it, restock it, and send it to others who are giving care. So they sent it to some firefighters who received this gift basket and met with a little note saying, hey, this came from Healing Place. It blessed us. We want it to bless you. And so those guys are committed to pay it forward. And I wonder how many times that thing will circulate and just a, a, a small seed will produce a lot of fruit. Come on, that's, that's one way of setting joy in front of you. You know, I was talking to our uh, campus pastor in Eswatini in Swaziland, Africa, and Pastor Roger told me that we were able to use our facility right there in Baban, Swaziland, and that's a training facility now that nurses are being equipped and trained for how to care for people with the COVID-19 virus. Isn't that amazing that God would use that space? There's a lot of positive things happening out of this. Um, you, you know, uh, Pastor Ryan came to us uh, uh, several days ago, and, and he said that there was a need at Lady of the Lake Hospital for some iPads. And, uh, you know, those that have, have gotten sick, I mean, it, you can't even visit them. You know, so it's like I can imagine being a, a single parent and your child, you know, is in quarantine in the hospital and you can't be at the bedside of your child. And so these iPads are giving parents a chance to communicate with their children. And so through your generosity, we were able to purchase some iPads to create bridges of communication so hope and healing can happen. Isn't that awesome? You know, you got to set some joy in front of you. The Bible says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. People were lining the streets of Jerusalem that Palm Sunday, and they were celebrating. And you know what it tells me? What was the joy of Jesus? First of all, to do the will of the Father. He was obedient to the very end. But you know what else the joy of Jesus was? It was people. It was rescuing lost humanity. His heart was to do the will of the Father. And by his sacrificial giving, all of us have a way to be healed. I think that's powerful. Don't allow the dread of what's ahead to keep you from the joy that's right here in front of you. The Bible says in verse 9, And the crowds that went before him and that followed him, they were shouting something. And this is what they shouted. Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the highest. I want you to see this. The cult represents the humility of Jesus. The crowd speaks of the joy of Jesus. But I want you to see the cheers. The cheers speak to the salvation of Jesus. They shouted a word, Hosanna. Come on, somebody say Hosanna. That word in the Aramaic literally means save us now. Save us now. Now, granted, there was an expectation that the people had that day in Jerusalem. They wanted Jesus to topple the Roman government and to set them free politically. But Jesus didn't have a political agenda. In fact, a lot of people in the crowd, John's gospel tells us they were there that day because they had seen the miracle Jesus had performed when he raised Lazarus from the dead. Man, he's raising people from the dead. Surely he's got to be the guy that's going to take care of, of, of the Caesar and this Roman entourage. Let's get them out of here so we can have our life and our land back. Can I tell you, Jesus' purpose was so much greater than political. He didn't come to give them political freedom. Jesus was preparing to die to give them spiritual freedom. You see, the cheers, the cheers represent the salvation of God Almighty coming to a people who didn't even know they needed it. You see, the, 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 the expectation of the crowd was much smaller. Jesus is saying, listen, if I set you free politically, eventually you're going to be bound by something else. But if I set you free spiritually, you're going to be free for the rest of your life. The Bible says, he that the Son has set free is free indeed.
You're not just temporarily freed, looking over your shoulder, wondering if your past is going to catch up with you, wondering if your oppressor is going to come and, and put you in bondage again. But you'll be free indeed. Spiritual, that's salvation. You know, there was a greater enemy than Rome. It was the sin that lived within them. That was the greater enemy. And I want you to know this. There's a greater, there's a more dangerous virus than the coronavirus. It's the sin that lives within us. But the good news is this. Scientists don't have to scramble to find a vaccine for the virus of sin. Heaven already took care of that. It's called the blood. The blood of Jesus. What Jesus did 2,000 years ago was enough. It was sufficient. And if you're free in your spirit, then there's nothing in this world that can hold you down. Sickness may attack my body, but it can't touch my soul. You know what? I, I, I may go through a season of, of struggle, but I know on the other side of this struggle, the one whose hand holds the world is holding my life too. Come on, you feel that? You sense that? Uh, the scripture goes on to say in verse 10, when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. They were stirred up and they were saying, who is this? Who is this guy? I mean, we're expecting one thing. We've seen some things, but here he comes in riding on the humility of a donkey. Uh, man, we're, we're celebrating him, thinking we're getting saved politically, but Jesus has a totally different agenda. Who in the world is this man? And I want you to know how you answer that question. They asked that 2,000 years ago, but that's still the question that needs to be answered today. Who is Jesus to you? He's got to be more than just a great teacher or a powerful prophet. He's got to be the Messiah. Who is Jesus? Who is this man? You've got to settle that issue in your own soul. And before we receive communion together, I want to give you a chance to do that right now. Right where you are, I want you to just bow your heads just for a moment. And I want you to take a little inventory, evaluate your life. Some of us have knowledge of God, but maybe we've never received the gift of salvation through Jesus in our own life. Uh, listen, Jesus, C.S. Lewis said, he's either, he's either a, a liar, he's a lunatic, or he is Lord. Either everything he said is just false, either he's just crazy, or maybe, just maybe, he is who he said he was. He's the Lord, the Messiah. Right there in this, that, that moment, uh, maybe you're in your living room or maybe you're at work. or If you could just carve out a little sacred space, just you and the Lord. If you're here today and you say, you know, Pastor, I don't think I've, I've ever fully surrendered my life to Jesus. I want to give you a chance to do that right now. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. I'll tell you the greatest gift that you can receive is the gift of salvation and the only one who can give it is Jesus and Jesus alone I want to lead you in a prayer would you would you do this would, would you just put your hand on your heart because this is a, a heart issue it's not about what's happening in your head but it's about what what's going on on the inside in your soul with your hand on your heart I want to pray over you now in fact I want you to say this after me say dear Jesus I come to you right now just as I am. All of my good, all of my bad, and even the ugly. God, I offer myself to you. I open up my heart, and I invite you to come in. Wash me. Cleanse me. Heal me. Forgive me. And set me free. Put my life on a path of purpose. From this day forward, I confess Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. So according to your word, I am your child. You are my God. You're my Lord and my Savior. I am yours and you are mine. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, can we clap our hands for those that prayed that prayer? Fantastic. I, I, I really sense the Spirit of God is speaking to so many people in our country. And I know that these are, are, are perilous times. These are troubling times. But I sense God speaking and people listening. Today, you've heard the word of the Lord. And your heart has responded. If, if you prayed that prayer, we want to celebrate that with you. In fact, we want to hear from you. You can text HPC Connect to 41411. Again, it's all one word. HPC Connect. Text that to 41411. 411 and our staff and our pastors we'd love to come alongside you and help you as you take your next steps in God I think that's so good